The committee will come to order. After recognizing myself and the ranking member, my friend, Mr. Berman, for seven minutes each for our opening statements, I'll recognize any other members that want to seek recognition for a one-minute uh, opening statement. We will then hear from our witnesses. I would ask you to summarize your prepared statements for five minutes before we move to the question and answer with members under the five-minute rule. And without objection, the witnesses' uh, prepared statements will be made part of the record, and members may have five days to insert statements and questions for the record subject to the length limitation in the rules. And the chair now recognizes herself for seven minutes. Thank you. A robust and effective Office of Inspector General is Congress's first line of defense against waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement. This committee and the State Department's Inspector General must have a shared interest in ensuring that, State Department, that the State Department is managed effectively and efficiently to achieve our nation's foreign policy goals. Now more than ever, given global developments and emerging threats combined with economic challenges facing our nation, we must have a State Office of Inspector General that challenges State Department management to function with transparency and accountability. For over 30 years, the General Accountability Office has raised concerns about the independence and reliability at, of the Office of Inspector General for the Department of State. GAO first questioned the structural independence of the state OIG in 1978 when it pointed out the problem with appointing Foreign Service officers as inspectors general who then leave the state OIG office to become ambassadors for the department. In short, how can they be trusted to provide objective, unbiased reviews of State Department operations when their career advancement hinges on the type of assessment they give to programs or peers? GAO noted that the revolving door was also an issue even for lower level positions in which active Foreign Service officers are assigned to lead embassies and consular post positions. Congress intended to remedy this problem in 1986 when the Inspector General position was made a presidential appointment and when career members of the Foreign Service were specifically excluded from the pool of eligible candidates. However, as GAO noted in its 2007 report, this restriction has often been circumvented for extended periods when no permanent IG is chosen to serve and instead a Foreign Service officer holds the position in an acting capacity. Our committee has received a number of whistleblower complaints through our new website feature where whistleblowers allege that due to the revolving door relationship between state OIG and state management, adverse findings regarding contract management have been whitewashed and managerial decisions regarding promotions, awards, assignments, and grievances were susceptible to arbitrary adjudications. The Project on Government Oversight, POGO, an independent nonprofit organization that investigates government misconduct, directly calls into question the objectivity of the State Department's Inspector General's office and of its leadership. Among other things, POGO questions amb the ambassador's personal ties to department manager management. Citing various emails it has obtained, POGO asserts that the ambassador was doing just enough regarding state operations in Iraq to try to avoid losing jurisdiction to the Special Inspector General for Iraq reconstruction, but not enough to identify and address the problems. This committee also received separate evidence of disturbing misconduct in state OIG criminal investigations. The committee's review was triggered by a March 2010 referral sent by a federal district court judge who was disturbed by evidence that a state OIG investigation connected with a case before him had been seriously compromised. Our staff continues to look into these allegations. Whether real or perceived, compromise of independence is a serious problem for state OIG. In addition, GAO has long criticized state OIG for over-reliance on inspections as an oversight mechanism. In its previous report, GAO
found state OIG inspection reports to be superficial and thin, lacking in quality assurance normally required of an OIG. Acknowledging that state OIG has had a requirement periodically to inspect every post, GAO recommended fuller use of audits instead. As our GAO, GAO witness will describe during her testimony, audits require more stringent requirements than inspections for documentation to support findings and are subject to external peer review. This makes a significant difference regarding quality assurance. The recent reclassification of all audits conducted by the state OIG's Middle East Regional Office provides a case in point. An external peer review conducted by the OIG of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration found numerous reporting deficiencies that caused state OIG to reclassify all Middle East Regional Office audits from January 2008 to September 30, 2009 as inspections. State OIG has indicated that the uh, Middle East Regional Office uh, will be folded into its larger audit unit. However, the fact that the Middle East Regional Office performed so poorly in such a high-risk area is deeply troubling. I am particularly concerned with adequate oversight in this area given the billions of dollars that will be at stake as operations in Iraq are transitioned from the Department of, Sta of Defense to the Department of State. In preparation for this hearing, we asked GAO to determine whether State OIG is making progress toward implementing its longstanding recommendations. And uh, your report indicates that actions are underway, but more needs to be done. We need confidence in the State OIG, and we will be vigilant in making sure that they continue to improve. 